day. Very important day. We have a lot of important days at our White House. And this is, to me, the future. I want to thank you all for being here to discuss a critical issue for our country's future. Winning the race to be the world's leading provider of 5G cellular communications networks. It's all about 5G now. We were 4G, and everybody was saying we have to get 4G. And then they said, before that, we have to get 3G. And now we have to get 5G, and 5G is a big deal. And that's going to be there for a while. And I guess uh, at some point, we'll be talking to you about number six. What do you think? Do you think that is really tremendous? Secure 5G networks will absolutely be a vital link to America's prosperity and national security in the 21st century. 5G will be as much as 100 times faster than the current 4G cellular networks. It will transform the way our citizens work, learn, communicate, and travel. It will make American farms more productive, American manufacturing more competitive, and American health care better and more accessible. Basically, it covers almost everything when you get right down to it. Pretty amazing. In the United States, our approach is private sector driven and private sector led. The government doesn't have to spend lots of money. According to some estimates, the wireless industry plans to invest $275 billion in 5G networks, creating 3 million American jobs quickly, very quickly, and adding $500 billion to our economy. And as you probably heard, we had another alternative of doing it. That would be through government investment and leading through the government. We don't want to do that because it won't be nearly as good, nearly as fast, and especially in that business. I think that they'll be better doing the job than a lot of the folks that we know and love. To accelerate and incentivize these investments, my administration is focused on freeing up as much wireless spectrum as needed. We're going to free it up so they'll be able to get out there and get it done, and removing regulatory barriers to the build-out of networks. As Chairman Pai will discuss with you in a moment, the FCC is taking very bold action, probably bolder than they've ever taken before. It's a new frontier to make wireless spectrum available. By next year, the United States is on pace to have more 5G spectrum than any other country in the world. That's a big statement. The FCC has also taken action to streamline the permitting process for 5G infrastructure with state and local governments. That's a big deal. Uh, it takes too long to get permits. We're going to free that situation up, and we're going to put limits, and uh, the local areas are going to listen to us very, very strongly. They have a big incentive to do that. They must now approve new physical infrastructure within 90 days instead of many years. It can sometimes take three, four, and five years. Uh, we're going to put a limit of 90 days. And there is now a cap on the unreasonable fees local governments often charge. They get greedy. We're also working closely with federal agencies to get networks built in rural America faster and at much, much lower cost than it is even today. So now I'd like to introduce a very special man who's really worked hard and gained the respect of the world, truly, because they see what we're doing in our country, who will be making two major announcements to accelerate our 5G future and extend broadband access to every American. No matter where you are, you will have access very quickly to 5G, and it's going to be a different life. I don't know that it's going to be better. Maybe you're happy the way it is right now. <laughs> But I can say, technologically, it won't even be close. So, Chairman Pai, thank you very much. Please, say a few words. Thank you very much, Asia. Well, thank you, Mr. President, for your compelling vision of U.S. leadership on 5G. I also want to thank Larry Kudlow, the director of the National Economic Council, for your steadfast support of this vision. Uh, Mr. President, as you observed, America must win the race to 5G, the next generation of wireless connectivity. And this matters for two key reasons. The first is national competitiveness. We want the good-paying jobs that develop and deploy 5G technologies, jobs that support some of the folks in this room, to be created here in America. We want these technologies to give our economy a leg up as we compete against the rest of the world. 
The second reason U.S. leadership matters is that 5G will improve Americans' lives in so many ways, from precision agriculture to smart transportation networks to telemedicine and more. We want Americans to be the first to benefit from this new digital revolution. Ivanka worked very hard on this. Maybe say a couple of words. Well, thank you, and thank you, everyone, for being here today. Obviously, American dominance in the industries of the future is predicated on connectivity and digital connectivity, and 5G is the future. And so I think everyone in this room feels very comfortable to know it's in your very capable hands. And President, we thank you for your leadership on this critical issue. And I'm so glad that we were able to include in today's discussion our priorities on rural broadband. So that is something that, from the earliest days of the administration, we've sought to really deliver on. And with today's announcement, in addition to the milestones that have been achieved over the last two years, we can say that we're bringing 5G and the rural broadband. Trump just gave an epic speech at the UN, and I didn't realize that was going to happen to coincide with this video, which is going to be all about the UN. I'm going to use several Q posts where he talks about global government, where he talks about control of the world and the sides of the triangle that, uh, that we're having to break before we can become free people again, or for once, or however you want to look at it. First, let me thank everybody who has donated to my paypal.me. Thank you so much. Thank you for all the comments, likes, shares, and subscribes. It's been amazing. Thank you so much. So we'll continue on now. We'll get started. With my look at the UN, uh, it is not going to be a history of the UN. It is not going to be a look at how the UN has failed. I think it's obvious how the UN has failed. Conflicts have escalated. The uh, arms race has escalated. Global poverty has escalated, uh, in, in, depending on how you look at it. The refugee crisis is out of control. The UN is a complete and abject failure, as far as I'm concerned. And it is the biggest threat we face. It is a side of Q's triangle, in my opinion. Um, and Trump magnificently stood up to them today. Let's start there. America will always act in our national interest. The UN Human Rights Council has become a, grievous, a grave embarrassment to this institution, shielding grievous human rights abusers. So the US took the only responsible course and we withdrew from the Human Rights Council. For similar reasons, the US withdrew from the International Criminal Court. He says the ICC claims nearly universal jurisdiction over the citizens of every country, violating all principles of fairness, justice, and due process. He goes on, we will never surrender American sovereignty to an unelected, unaccountable global bureaucracy. We reject the ideology of globalism, and we embrace the doctrine of patriotism. Yes! Yes!
this is my proposal to you, that one side of the pyramid involves the UK and Saudi Arabia. You'd have to know the history of the UK with Saudi Arabia to understand, but what happened in Saudi Arabia recently with the arrest is the end of the Ibn Saud dynasty. Trump's sword dance was in May 2017, and November 2017, Bin Salman initiated sweeping arrests. Bin Salman is not of the Ibn Saud dynasty. So that part of the triangle is the one that is destroyed, and we have two remaining. Now, Rothschild ties in to the UK control grid, <clears throat> so I believe that's the threat to the Rothschild dynasty. Again, I don't have time in this video to get into the history of the UK and Saudi Arabia and Israel, but I believe that is what takes out the Rothschilds as well, at least hobbles them. And so let's look at the other sides of the pyramid. I believe this side of the pyramid, represented basically by the UN control grid, are the progressives, Democrats, and identity politics combined with socialism. And it's overseen by Soros, non-governmental organizations, academics, elites, the old guard, intelligence agents, media, activists, and they push for open borders, socialist economy, climate change, censorship, abortion, transgenderism, atheism, and pedophilia. That last one will be controversial, but many Anons know that this is foundational to the control grid. Pedophilia enables blackmail, it's huge money, sadly, and also warping the children helps them be controlled later in life. Uh, it's extremely hard to talk about. And I don't need to in this video, so I, I'll leave it there. I believe the final, the foundation of the pyramid is the New Age movement. I know that sounds a bit controversial. It's a one world religion, a one world government, where there is no good or evil, no God but man, there is a replacement of morality with science. <clears throat> they believe that Lucifer is the light bringer and the real God, and they are waiting for the reappearance of the Maitreya, or they also call it the Christ. and you have to learn to see through their language. Luciferians love inversion. They love to piggyback on things that people think are wholesome. Uh, I will be presenting in this video evidence to show you that the United Nations is occult-based, occult. And most of that comes back to Luciferianism. Let's move on. I have a lot to cover. Okay, so here is a uh, another Q post from November 11th. Hard to swallow, important to progress. Who are the puppet masters? House of Saud, four trillion. Rothschilds, two trillion. Soros, one trillion. Focus on above three. And don't they go back to this? 
Public wealth disclosures are false. Many governments of the world feed the eye. Could this be the eye? Could this be the eye? Think slush funds. Are there a feeder? Think war. It's a feeder. Think environmental pacts. Feeder. And doesn't the UN concern itself with all of those things? The eye of providence. This is the eye of providence. This is from the American one dollar bill or dollar bills. Follow the bloodlines. What is the keystone? Does Satan exist? Hmm. That seemed to come out of nowhere. Does the thought of Satan exist? Who worships Satan? What is a cult? I'm going to skip the rest down to here. Vladimir Putin has said, the new world order worships Satan. Haha, <laughs> I just realized it looks like I'm uh, wearing a hat. The New World Order has never had um, a chance to exert its control quite like it has now with the United Nations. I want to show you this. These are just some quotes from these people, which I won't go over all of them, but Teilhard, this is an interesting quote. This is a really interesting quote in light of something Trudeau recently said. So Teilhard calls the contributing universal energy that generates the omega point forces of compression. Skipping forward, this value is limitless and directly correlated with entropy. It suggests that as humans continue to interact, consciousness evolves and grows. Isn't it interesting that Trudeau was at a meeting recently and he said this. The world is moving towards more diversity, not less diversity. Uh, it's, it's a form of entropy uh, where, uh, where people will scatter, people will come with different perspectives. The advancement in communications, the raising standards of living around the world, the opportunity for education mean means that our communities, our boardrooms are, over the course particularly of this coming century, uh, going to be more and more diverse. And the I wonder if that's where he got his idea of entropy being related to diversity and this creating the omega point. Because Teilhard de Chardin argues that the more people bump up against one another and have to interact with clashes with each other, that we become Christ's, the omega point. We evolve as a species. I don't know about you, but at this point, uh, this is what I think about the UN. I just want it gone. But I have some bad news. They want a world parliament now. They want to revamp the charter of the UN. And this is a huge uh, initiative that's coming up this year, November 11th. Uh, there's a three-day conference surrounding November 11th in France. They want this world parliament. 
here it is here, the Paris Peace Forum, November 11th to 13th, 2018, Funded by private and public partners, the Paris Peace Forum is pleased to announce its first benefactors, skip down to the end, Open Society Foundation. George Soros wants to involve himself, of course he does, in the rewriting of the UN Charter. He wants to be there at this power, Paris Peace Conference and push for a world parliament now. They've been trying to get this for a long time. And there's a lot of talk about 2020, the big changes coming in 2020. I hope we do not have to subject ourselves to a world parliament. I mean, wouldn't that be the end then? Where will Trump be though on November 11th? He will be in France. He will be in France for their military parade for the armistice of World War I. But didn't I just say that there's this conference going on for the world parliament and this Paris Peace Forum on the same day. So he's gonna be there then. And all I can hope is that he's giving them this kind of a warning. Maybe Trump's going to go after the deep state further afield. Maybe he will take on these global bodies, as he is starting to do in his wonderful speech today. I don't know. But I hope so. Until next time, peace out.